All right, good evening, everyone. I see we're slowly joining here. We're almost at the amount of participants we have. So we're going to give it a few minutes before I uh, introduce our presenter tonight um, to let a few more people join. Looks like we're still getting quite a few participants coming in. So we'll just give it one minute or two. All right, great. Uh, so my name is Rachel. I am one of the admissions counselors here at Stony Brook University. Um, we have with us today Moira Chops, who will be, she is from the Department of Mathematics, and she will be presenting tonight. I will be behind the scenes along with a few other representatives from admissions. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session, so make sure that you, if you do have any questions, feel free to throw them into the Q&A and we will be answering those live at the end of the session. Uh, so I am going to pass it over to Moira and enjoy guys. Thanks Rachel. So hi everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Moira Chas, as I said, and I teach math here at Stony Brook. And today I have a presentation that is absolutely wonderful. I mean, not because of my presentation, but because the topic is is lovely. Hopefully you're seeing my screen now, uh, the, the slideshow. So uh, what I like to talk about is uh, the four dimensions. And you know, I put the two because sometimes thinking about two and three and four, it helps understand four. So let me just tell you a little about me since you are, you know, testing Stony Brook. So I, you probably guess from my accent, I'm not uh, from the US, I was born in Argentina. This is a street of my lovely Buenos Aires, which I really miss. And I study uh, in Buenos Aires. This is very standard in, you know, in Argentina, you usually study in the place you live. Um, I study a long career, which is only math. This is what we do there. At 18, you have to decide. And I was lucky enough that I like math and it worked for me. Then I did my PhD in Barcelona long story that maybe if you come to Stony Brook, I can tell you. And after a lot of a long winding road, I ended up at an associate professor here at Stony Brook. Here we see this wonderful sculpture that again, one day I could teach you about if you take one of my classes. Uh, and uh, here is me uh, in the green dress and uh, with the former chairman, those two students who work on research with me. I work a lot in, uh, I work in mathematics that is very understandable in general. I, I have been working through the years with undergraduates or high school, high school students who are interested in research and you know learning and understanding something really well. So, uh, and uh, I like the math I like is math usually connected with pictures. And I, I'm very proud of the little movie you see there that I made myself. Uh, so again, mathematics, oops, it's out of uh, frame, sorry about that. And I put a frog and I said, why I put a frog with, with who am I? Well, somebody said that mathematicians are either frogs or birds and the frogs, me, you know, they, they're like problem solvers. They know all the terrain around them a little bit, every little bit. And the birds, you know, they, they know structures and they overwhelm. Well, I like my problem solver. I really like that. And I work in different problems in, uh, in topology, uh, which is, you know, like geometry in dimensions uh, two and three. And I like to make things. The things that you see behind me are also in the screen. Uh, these are objects that I made either to explain mathematics or to understand it myself. And uh, recently I got totally crazy about a woman called Alicia Wool. She was born in 1850, it's very dead by now, as you can guess. And she studied things in the four dimensions. So I hope I have time to talk about her today. Uh, and let me just tell you a tiny bit more about me. I will try to do something, but it's very hard, something like I usually do, but it's really, really hard to do it you know, in a webinar where I can't see your faces. I mean, I normally I did do these admission talks and I'm walking around and interacting with people. This Zoom thing, it has its advantages, but it's not my thing. And I really miss the human interaction. However, 
even in Zoom, I interact. And the way I find it is uh, I'm going to have some polls during the, during the lecture just to see a little bit how I work. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, it's very hard. I don't see the Q&A or the chat because I concentrate in what I'm saying and I can't do two things at once. It's a very efficient way, you know, mathematicians usually do that. So, but Rachel promised that she will tell me if you have questions. So please uh, feel free to ask math questions. That's, I mean, about the topic I'm discussing, that's what I can answer. Admission questions, as Rachel said, will be at the end. And uh, the reason why I'm jumping topics because I have a lot to say and uh, a short time, but I really like to teach not you know, as in this uh, cartoon that you see here that I couldn't find the source where, you know, students are just bombarded. I try to people guide the thoughts and, you know, you arrive to the conclusion. I like more to ask questions than answer questions. Of course I answer questions, but I think if you think answers, not for the purpose of evaluating, for the purpose of thinking, you know, something happened in your brain and you learn. And now we're going to our topic. Now, here I put a picture, you know, what I'm going to do is, well, I have 45 minutes, I'm 40 because I did all this presentation about me. I'm going to just open a little crack on the door, just a little bit. And then if you want to know more, you really have to work. This is math, you know, usually everybody in math works a lot. I mean, I, here we have amazing mathematicians, people that, you know, when I was in other places, you know, you say the name with reverence and now they're my colleagues and still I feel slightly overwhelmed by that, even if I've been here for 20 years. But, you know, you see people, we have John Milner, who's, you know, an out of the chart mathematicians, he's 90, he comes here every day and works, but well, now he's not coming because this is COVID, but he works, you know, before he used to come every day and work and think and think. So if you want to understand more, I open the crack and then you keep going there. And here I have a question for you. So the instructions of how to answer are here are on the top of the screen. Uh, you can answer through a phone, you can text, you can answer through a web browser. I just would like to hear what do you, you know, what do you think, what, what comes to your mind when you think about four dimensions? or the fourth dimension, whatever you want to. And I don't have answers. Answer, please. Moira, is there a link we can put in the chat so they can access Yes, uh, you can, can you see the link in the screen? It says p-o-l-l-e-v.com slash mchas229. Thank you. People should say in the q and if it's, I don't know, there's any technical issue. I was uh, telling uh, Rachel and Tien that it was, uh, there was, they just changed the platform that I always use. So things are slightly different. No. Is that the no, one. no, not APP. Okay, here it is. They're answering. So not, uh, not. Oh, you can use the app, but you can, you know, the link is paulav.com mchas229. You know, I don't know if you can see the top of the screen. Somebody can see because you're answering. Oops, and I, I think I mess up. I, I move something. Well, maybe I move on. I can put it in the chat. Didn't occur to me. Oh, I can chat to you. I can chat to everyone. No, I put it in the chat and you can put it to everyone else. Sure. Yes, that sounds good. Do you see the top of my screen? Because some people might not see it if you don't. Here is where you can answer. So time, an imaginable non-Euclidean. This is what people are answering here. If you have to answer more than one word, you have to join in. Oh, okay. Six answers. Now, some people put sentences without joining with a little thing. So uh, they separate it. And if an answer is big, like time, means that uh, more than one person answer that. Moira, we have an answer in the Q&A too, if you want me to just tell you that. Sure. Um, 
we had maybe a time as the fourth dimension. Uh huh. That's the one that we have in the in the Q and A so far. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Time combined with third dimension. So come on, people. I mean, this is something you know. It's free. I'm not going to grade, and, and the names are not registered. And always use an opportunity to ask and answer. That will help you. And you know, sometimes you know, one is shy, but uh, it's very important. This is uh, this is an advice that I'm 55, so I can give advice. It's very good for you to actively answer and think. You know, if you are just there receiving talks, the thing most likely will wash over you. Okay, so I'm going to keep this open just to be curious, but I'm going to move on because as I said, I have an enormous amount of interesting things to show you. Oops, ah, sorry. And now it catapults I want you through time into a world that is yet to be. Why is it that we usually ignore the fourth dimension? You see, we can move in the other three. As the doctor said, up, down, forwards, backwards, sideways. But when it comes to time, we are prisoners. Inventor Bob Taylor's breakthrough into the realm of the fourth dimension is defied by his friend Alan Young. If that machine can do what you see it can, destroy it, George, before it destroys you. Every moment is a year, hurtling through the atomic wars of the future on an incredible excursion into the unknown. So this is a movie about a uh, called the time machine and you know, follows the idea that many of you suggested that the fourth dimension is time. And you can watch it. I watched it recently, I think in Amazon, you can rent it. And uh, it's written by H.G. Wells, who was a famous writer, very, very interesting, who also uh, studied science. So he used a lot of science in his, in his uh, stories. And uh, he, you know, on the top, you see the, the machine here is the, the weird bike. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about the fourth dimension as time, although it's a very good use. This is movie. This is, an, I didn't see this one, but I couldn't resist this weird poster. Uh, this uh, is a four dimension as space. And you know, this man appearing through the wall is more related to it. So I have an incredibly ambitious plan, which I know I'm not going to do, you know, I maybe half if we're lucky. And so let's start. So the first is, you know, we're talking about the fourth dimension and in mathematics, definition is a very important thing. We really say precise, what are we talking about? You know, because then your discussion is much more meaningful. It's quite often that discussions that you have, though you hear around, they are because people give different content to words. And in mathematics, we have a reduced set of words so we can, uh, give them full meaning after assuming some, but most of them, they have a full meaning. So we are going to say, what do we mean by four dimension? And the definition, it's uh, a little, uh, a mouthful, but uh, sorry, I'm going to, this was, the slide should have gone a little later, but anyway. So I'm going to give you a definition that is slightly hard to swallow, but let's go slowly. So he said, uh, the elements of zero dimension are points. This is Henri Poincaré, a, a French mathematician. So Z, points are dimension zero. And now suppose you have a continuum. A continuum is like a piece you know, of stuff, you know, all in one piece. And if to break it, we can break it with things of zero dimensions. Then we say the thing that we could break is of one dimension. So this is an example, you know, we broke this curve with a point, it's a very thick point because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to see it. And then this means that the curve is one dimension because we can break it in pieces with points. The circle is also one dimension. Here with one point, we cannot break it in two pieces or more, but with two points we can. So that makes it uh, also one dimensional. Then it, for the two-dimensional is the same. The blob here in black is, is another continuum. And to break it into pieces, we can break it with a piece of one dimension. And in this case, I break it with the same piece that we just decided it was one dimension 
in the slide before. So since I broke it into two pieces with a one dimensional thing or object, then the blob here in black is, is uh, two dimensional and so on, you know? So to break uh, some, if something is of three dimension, if I can break it into pieces with something of two dimensions. So this definition is very good. I know it's not easy to swallow and you know, I'm giving you advanced math in your high school. And it has issues because for instance, a double cone, which is a very, it has a very nice equation, it's a standard uh, shape, is uh, it can be breaking, it has a point in the middle. So, but for objects that are kind of not weird, uh, it's fine. There are other ways of defining dimension. And this took, you know, this notice this, this definition is for 1900. So this means it took us humanity a lot of time to arrive. It's an idea that is hard to pinpoint. So here we have another thing of one dimension. And another way of defining dimension is how many directions you need to move to one point to the other. So here we see a little monkey on a line and if he, want to, he, goes, he wants to go from one point to another, just with one number, you know, and the sign that gives you the direction, he can arrive anywhere in the line. So this makes a line uh, one dimensional. Again, I'm using another definition. Of course, you can also say, well, with a point, we can break the line into the pieces. So it's, it's, uh, it's one dimensional. And, uh, but he can jump, of course. So now, I'm going to ask you a question. So here we have a monkey moving on the circle. How many directions has the circle? Sorry, how many dimensions have the circle? And, oops. Oh, sorry, I'm having some issue. This is not it. Okay, so would you mind answering in the chat how many dimensions have the circle? How many dimensions have the circle? And Rachel, you tell me whatever they say, if they say something. Oh, you're muted. Okay, I, see, I hear it. Okay, I see. I hear two ones and, you know, by the way, making mistakes is part of learning. So you really, uh, uh, I mean, answering, I mean, I'm not expecting perfect answers. I'm expecting thinking brains. So, I mean, again, I, what I ask, which is not exactly what I wrote, is how many dimensions does the circle have? And remember that the dimension, you know, we just gave a definition. How do we need points to break it? And we saw already in a circle, you know, with two points, we can break it. Now, some of you answered two, and that's a good answer because it's a little weird. I mean, the circle lives in a space of two dimensions. You know, this lives in the plane. I think that's why you're answering too, and it's a very common sense answer. But the circle itself, it doesn't matter where it lives. It matters, you know, how can I break it? Or it matters how many, how many numbers I need to go from one point to the other. So to move along the circle, you just have to say, what angle do you move? So it's dimension, uh, it's dimension one. I see many good answers and keep thinking about it because it's a good exercise for your brain. And let me skip, uh, I'm going to skip because I'm already so behind that uh, I can't believe. So four dimensions, what is it? Well, let me do a little parenthesis. You might know the Pac-Man game, uh, I don't know, I think if it came when I was a teenager uh, in Argentina, uh, you might have heard. And what you see here is that these little creatures, when they come at, uh, to a, out, of, out of the um, maze in one side, they can enter on the other side. So you see, you know, this happening. Here I have uh, these things, seems like a like um, two-dimensional thing. It's like a square, and that's true. But really, what I wanted to discuss is, even if it looks like a square or a rectangle, this is morally a cylinder. And why am I saying that? Well, because since living from here 
comes in through the other side in the same spot, these things work as these two sides are glued. So your mind makes all this uh, thing and understands it perfectly. I mean, you know that, and if you think for a second, and again, this is you know my little crack that I open, but you have to keep thinking to swallow this. Uh, this is a cylinder, the rectangle, it really, you know, the structure of how these things move, it looks like it's, it's like a cylinder. So four dimension, this is a little metaphor to understand the four dimension. We're going to think of objects that are not physical, you know, are not even going to have time. So we cannot think of some physical model, but still our mathematical mind can uh, grasp them and, you know, and, and they have application too. So the monkeys, they are trying to build a four dimensional space. So what is the dimension of the cylinder? Hollow. Let's see if this one works. I had some issue with the slides and this should be working now. You can answer as before. Some people ask, you know, whether the answer of the question of the dimension of the circle is infinity and the answer is no. The dimension of the circle is one. And the important thing, and answer my question, or I feel totally defeated, please. Uh, maybe I should put the answer in the polls. Polls, e, uh, the same website as before. We're getting a lot of answers in the chat. Yeah, I'm seeing that, I'm seeing that. So okay. I'm not talking, yeah. Okay, so people say three and think, and the question is what I said in the beginning, what do I mean by dimensions? So I'm already told you, what do I mean by dimensions? So you have to give that meaning to dimension because my questions refer to the meaning I gave. So, and I claim that this is dimension two because I can break it into two pieces with a curve. If I put a circle here, if I draw a circle here in the middle or whatever, you know, I can break it. The circle is dimension one. So then the cylinder is dimension two. And of course it's because it's two because it's hollow. Somebody said, yes, if it was a full of it's, it's three dimensions and I need something of two dimensional to break it into pieces. But this is, I'm, I'm illustrating the importance of a definition. And if you wanna think in a fun way about this, uh, these ideas, uh, there's the, you know, just Google geometry games. There's wonderful games that are free. They're from Android or, or, or iOS. And you can play games, you know, like in, in different spaces, you play a tic-tac-toe. Usually I have my students in topology to play to understand how we can have a representation in our mind of a space, which is exactly not that we see. This space is not going to be a square morally. So geometrygames.org. Okay, so now let's move on. What is a square? Okay, now you need to answer me. I'm going to send in the chat. You answer always in the same spot. I would like to see your answers in my screen. It's okay if you answer in the chat, but if you click on the link, Rachel, can you send this? Uh, okay, shape. A square is a shape, good. That's true. What else? What is a square? Give me the definition. Oh, you have to put, sorry, this is my mistake. You had to put the little, I see something that said it good. Okay, so this is, uh, you have to join the, I, this is my bad setting, uh, join the, the words by a, by a symbol. But somebody said it's a quadrilateral with equal sides and equal angles. Well, well, what about a parallelogram? So, but you know what a square is. It's very hard to give a precise definition and uh, and I don't, you know, somebody said a visual representation of a square, you know, this depending on the setting, it might be good. So it's four sided, it's a polygon, it's a regular polygon of four sides, you know, has four congruent angles. 
and uh, oh, and I'm sorry, and I just say, made a mistake because somebody said equal size and, equal, and right angles, that's good. Equal size and equal angles, a parallelogram doesn't work. So Siddharth was, was right. Anyway, so here we have a square. And you know, one thing we do in mathematics is you know, generalize. So maybe we said, okay, let's try to have a shape with equal size and equal angles, but now they're not three. And then we add you know, pentagon, hexagon, you know, names are less important than the properties. So these are regular polygons and they generalize the idea of a square. And notice that they are special because they have all this symmetry. You know, they are shapes that if I pick them up and move them in certain place and put them back, if you don't see me, you know, while I'm doing this, and you, uh, I ask you, did I move it? Well, it depends on the move I do. You might not know. Maybe I can reflect it or rotate. You know, in a certain angle. Certain polygons, you know, they have certain symmetries. And this is one of the reasons that makes them very, very interesting. So here I generalize and I look for patterns, which is an activity that we always do in mathematics. And of course, I have to be careful because when I said, if I said only equal sides and equal angles, well, here we have equal sides and not equal angles. And you know, with equal sides and equal angles, we have to be careful anyway. So here we see in dimension one, we have a segment in dimension two, the equivalent of a segment is a square. And in dimension one, here I have nothing. And in dimension two, we have regular polygons generalizing the square. So here we have a vestige. I gave this talk or some version of the talk in Spanish. And here we have generalizar, it's in Spanish. And, you know, when we go one more dimension, so we have segment, square, and cube. These are three things, uh, three objects, mathematical objects, you know, that they are analogous one or the other in one more dimension. And the regular polygons, which, uh, how many are they? How many regular polygons do we have? I ask it in the chat now. Somebody can answer. Infinite, yes. Yeah, there are infinitely many, but the platonic solids, so remember, equal size and equal angles, that's a regular polygon. But if we ask for platonic solids, well, there's only five. Stranger, huh? there's only five. So here we have shapes whose faces, these are solids whose walls are regular polygons and they have to be very symmetric. They look the same at every vertex and every edge. So again, we keep generalizing. Here I have a picture. I'm going to skip this because I'm behind. So now let's go to dimensions. Uh, and uh, you might have heard there's a very old novel published in 1888 called Flatland. And it's a story about a world that is in two dimensions. And there's a story of a square who uh, has adventures, the people, the people, the beings, the creatures in that land, they are polygons. I mean, the male people are polygons. The more size you have, the more, the better you are. Oh yeah, read that book. It's free now because it's so old. It's, it's so interesting, there's a movie, but read the book first if you can. And I'm not going to look at the chat because I get distracted, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> and this, this, uh, this, um, this book, well, and the women are, are segments that annoys me uh, quite a bit, if you can imagine. They are segments because they are the least of the beings and they have a lot of rules, but this guy was doing a satire of the Victorian society. He's making fun of how women were not considered as, you know, in the same level as men. No, he's not really saying that women are inferior. But let's see how, uh, how does Flatland look? So, the yellow thing that you see there is flatland. And we're going to try to imagine how a being in flatland, what will be the landscape? Again, you imagine you are a creature in flatland. And just to help us, I put a little seal here and it's not two dimensional, but let's imagine it's two dimensional. And the seal is looking at the beings in flatland. So this here, the, the rectangle is showing the beans moving. This little band downstairs is what the seal sees. 
you know, because it's just at eye level. So this is the vision of, of the world of the seal. You know, in the same way, you know, you can say, well, it looks almost two dimensional. I mean, I make it a little fake, otherwise we wouldn't see anything. But the point is, when you look at things, I mean, you we, we reconstruct the shape. But if you do the analogy from us, when you look at things, they are like a picture, you know, and they are like uh, two dimensional, the things we see. We are three dimensional. The world we see is like a picture, two dimensional. So let's think about a cube. And how can, you know, suppose you are two dimensional and you want to understand a cube and there's a few ways you can do it. So one is thinking about the construction. So there's this you know, process of, I'm, I'm putting it here and I'm going to explain it here. In zero dimensions, a cube is a point. In one dimension, as we said, it's a segment. Now we're going to look two dimensions. So what you do to construct a cube, or one of the things you can do is grab your segment, double it, and slide one segment at some distance, the appropriate distance. And you know, you, you're going to trace all your path so you make a square. And then you have two cubes, and then it's going to happen here. You slide them, you slide, you double slide them, and then you get a cube. And that, it's hard to imagine, but we're going to see how we can keep doing it uh, even in four, five, five dimensions. So, but let's go back to our being. So our being, you know, is going to think of the construction. One of the ways, you know, he can, he or she, or they can understand is uh, constructing this that is called the net. And I have here, Hopefully you can see me, this is a net. And what it has done, I made this, it has instruction of how to glue the sides to make a cube. Now, if you are two dimensional, you can't fold. This is all what you have. So, but you know, you can imagine because we have these powerful minds that you can fold and I'm going to glue this side with this side. So I fold, For, to fold, you need one more dimension. You need three dimensions. You go to a solid. So I fold following the, the, the arrows. And if you can't see me because the screen is tiny, you can see the picture. So we can fold again. When we fold, you know, we leave the dimension two. I mean, still the, the boundary of the cube is, you know, the, the outside of the cube is dimension two, but to fold, we need to be in a space of three dimensions. So the two dimensional idea cannot do it, but I can imagine it. Another way a two dimensional being could understand a three dimensional world is uh, by shadows, shades, no shadows, shades, shadows, shadows. Sorry, that's my English that sometimes fail, Sh shadows. So here, and there's different ways that shadows can be. For instance, you can project, you know, you can put a, like a flash line here or you can push a flash that really far that the rays are parallel. These are different ways. And of course, what you see, the shadow is not the cube, but you know it's a shadow. So maybe this helps your mind reconstruct the cube. Of course, you know, in this case, for instance, some of the squares original that form the walls of the, of the cube are no longer squares. You know, this thing here is, is like a trapezoid. But still, you know, again, we, we distort the shape because we are squishing something that it has thickness into a two-dimensional thing. But we are squishing it, you know, with some mathematical ideas. Another way of understanding is by looking at slices. So here, this is really neat. Oh gosh, look at this. So how would this uh, being in, in, in flat land would see a sphere? A sphere is going to uh, traverse the world. The being lives here and doesn't know anything else. And this here in this little land is what we would see. Maybe, you know, if it looks as well and see the shadow, you see it's very, it's very green in the middle. So you can distinguish that this is a circle in the same way that we reconstruct three-dimensional things from our vision. 
that this is what happens with a sphere. Here are my shadows and I'm going more slices. Here are slices of a cube. And you know, now we have a cube passing through flatland. And this is, you know, we, we see the cube and we just see there what is there in, in the land. And uh, so this is what we're going. Look at this fantastic here. This is a cube moving and the shadow moves with it. And here, and the cube is rotating. And we see the shadow. On the right here, we have a movie of a 4D cube that I'm going to tell you in a second what it is, but this is a tease. So this 4D cube is rotating and we see it all this form, but this is the same as this four dimensional creature would see it here. So let's go on three and four and I, my, my minutes are going, are, are hush, I'm doing half of what I wanted. So here we have on the, on the left, we're going to see what we saw before. On the right, we have a three-dimensional sphere, which is something that we can't see. A three-dimensional sphere has a solid wall. I know it's hard to swallow. And it's passing through, we can think our world. So you know, in the same way that a two-dimensional being was seen in circles, what we would see is spheres. Huh. And I want to talk a little more about the cube. So here is a cube. And we said this is the construction. So we are, we're making it like in a Lego thing. Here, we're making a cube. And you know, we're gluing it. But of course, if you want to glue a cube that naturally lives in the four dimensional space, you have to deform it. So this is what we do. And again, another way of thinking about this is now adding one more to the picture that we have. And Again, now we cannot do it in our physical space, but we can do it in our mathematical mind. So we have two cubes and we're going to duplicate the cube here and slide one cube. We don't have enough directions, but here you see there is this picture here that you have seen. This is the image of a tesseract. Now this image here is, is, is like a box without a lead. It's missing something. I'm going to skip this, oops. Uh, because uh, let me see, yes. So let me go back here. I went a little fast. So notice that when we make the cube in the movie, in the, the four dimensional cube in the movie of the right, we start with eight cubes and then we have to glue them. Well, you can't glue them in three space. So here, what we do is we deform it. This is a little cube in the center is, is the, the cube there that is, is, is in yellow. And some words are not showing because they are, uh, otherwise we wouldn't see anything. And this is a cube here. So you should look at my picture, which is hopefully not too small. And here I have another cube. They are all distorted because this is a shadow in the same way that it was a shadow before. And then remember that when we have this box, which we look from outside, looks like a square. I have a picture here. This is like a shadow of a cube here. And notice that we don't have a top, you know, if, if it's a projection, a shadow of a cube. So in the same way, this little gadget needs a top and we can't put it because we live in three dimensions. And my last thing, I have four, five minutes maybe. Suppose you can't touch the black line and this green circle wants to, it's in Flatland, it's a, it's a being in Flatland, and wants to visit his friends, the square and the line. So how can he do? So it's, he's very sad. So how can he do? I'm going to skip my question and I'm going to show you the answer. So what he does is he asks a three-dimensional friend to pick him up and move it around. So, in your land, he wouldn't be able to never see his friends if he cannot touch the green line. But, you know, if you had one more dimension, and remember, for them, the universe is flat, so it's hard to conceive. And I'm telling you this, you know, understand them because this is easy. Uh, they will make it easy for us to understand. Same thing with these triangles, you know, you can make them coincide by flipping them. And now the analogous thing is that, well, suppose we have two women 
And one is strange, you know, her heart is not at the left, like most of us, it's on the right. And then she would like to move and be overlapped exactly with the woman with the, you know, with the heart on the left. So of course, in three space, this is not possible. If you have some shape, you know, in the mirror image, you cannot just overlap them. But if she goes to the four dimension, that's the key of the four dimension, the key is mathematics, learn mathematics, and then she can travel and there he can flip in certain way. Not all the ways are good, but some ways are good. And comes back and the heart now it's uh, on, on the other side. So this is something mysterious that can happen in the four dimension. And another thing very strange is, remember that this line that you cannot cross. So the square there is in a jail, he can't get out. But if a three dimensional being comes, can pick him up. Or in the same way, if that woman there is in a box, in a closed box, and there was one more dimension that we can't perceive, the woman there will be able to uh, be picked up just by this four dimensional being. And let me tell you something very, very quick. So this can be, this, this table that I did in the beginning can be generalized, generalized and generalized. And uh, you know we can have cues in all dimensions and you can have these regular you know, polytops in all dimensions. And uh, well, there was this fantastic mathematician, Ludwig Schaffli, who discovered them. And, uh, and this woman who I'm studying, I'm also studying math history because the day has not enough hours. So Alicia Bull, she, uh, a friend of the family explained something about the cube in four dimension and she got totally hooked. You know, this is a family who's very, very lustrous, but I don't have time. I wrote about it. So if you want to know more, you can Google me. I'm the only more chess in the web as much as I know. And you go to my website and there's an article I wrote about her and uh, I'm still writing. I think I'm writing a book about her. Well, she studied slices of these four dimensional polytops all while raising children and not having much money. And just because she was persistent and interested and really loved geometry. So she constructed this model here on the right. And this, is, this happens here before the picture I show here is taken. A Dutch mathematician have making this drawing for an article he wrote about the same topic, four dimensional, this regular, the, the analogs of the four dimensional polytops. Polygon, sorry, four dimensional platonic solids. The four dimensional elements of the platonic solids. This happens when I'm trying to rush up. Anyway, these two people, and this happens in math quite often, they did exactly the same thing in different places, more or less at the same time. And for a you know, fantastic coincidence, she learned about this paper and wrote to him, and they started a collaboration and they wrote together papers. And she kept studying and you know, discovered you know, fantastic mathematical. Uh, structures like how to this this thing to morph uh, this uh, one platonic solid into other and pass it in the middle from another interesting shapes that you see here, and uh, she studied this. She made these are pictures made by her in about you know 1890. These are sections of polytops, and uh, I think uh, maybe. Uh, let me just tell you one more thing, uh, which is that this, um, you, on the right in red, you see the net of the 120 cell. This is a regular polytop. It's like the equivalent of this thing. This is the net of a cube, you know, the, the building blocks, the walls of a cube without being glued. And, you know, if I'm two dimensional, again, I can't fold it to glue it and make a cube. Well, we're three dimensional, so we cannot fold this. But if we had one more dimension, we can fold it. I make something that just uh, 120 cell, which the shadow is here. This is made of, well, these fantastic shapes. It's made of dodecahedrons. Sorry, I'm about to finish. Here is a dodecahedron. And this is made of all little dodecahedrons that are distorted because it's a shadow, the shadow of 
a 4D thing in our 3D world. So, and I could keep going, but I know my time has ended. I really like this topic and uh, I, don't, I shouldn't show so much enthusiasm because I'm always thinking, how can they pay me a salary to you know, teach math and think about math all day long? Well, some part of my, not, it's not all fun, but most of this part is fantastic. So maybe don't show this to the authorities, please. Uh, and I'm done. Thank you for your attention and uh, hope to see you here. Great, thank you, Moira. So we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, the first one being, would non-platonic solids also be considered to be three-dimensional solids? How would they fit into our flat land, quote unquote, definition? Well, if you look at solids, I mean, I mean, I take this because they are, you know, since they are so symmetric and so, you know, we understand them. Sometimes we, we need to, to understand something, we need a simple going to stop sharing maybe. So to understand certain shapes, you need to be simple. That's why uh, I, you know, I, I put the example of the, of the non-platonic, of the platonic solids, but, uh, but there are ways to understand, you know, and there's a lot, if you Google around, you will see there's a lot of uh, things uh, about, you know, understanding four dimensional shapes in our three dimensional world. It's just, it's more complicated when there's less symmetry. Great, thank you. Another question we have is, is it plausible to think of time as the fourth dimension? Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh gosh, I wanted to talk about that. Yes. So for the image, I mean, like the idea is, and this is how, you know, one of the ways that people started thinking about four dimension is, well, we have space, which is three dimensional because with three points, we can go to one spot to the other. I mean, three numbers, you know, are enough, but, Maybe you can see our universe evolving in time. So time is like the fourth coordinate. And that's the way, you know, physicists might think. Uh, me, I like math mathematics for itself. So uh, I just think about, you know, four, di four dimensions mathematically, but it's a really good and useful model to think time about the four dimension. The thing is, if you study abstractly, you can apply whatever you learn, you can apply to time as a four dimension. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a next question. What dimension is our universe? Is it 3D, 4D, or maybe even unbounded in dimensions? Is this even something we could figure out? Oh, I think we can figure out everything uh, if you give us enough time. <laughs> but uh, if you look at just the universe as the space we live in, it's three-dimensional. We don't know the shape as a three-dimensional object. It maybe is it a three-dimensional cube? Probably not. You know, it's, maybe it's a three-dimensional sphere. Maybe it's another three-dimensional object. Uh, but if we don't put time in the equation, then it's, it's three-dimensional. It could be infinite, could be not, could be unbounded. Okay, awesome. And then we have kind of a more fun question. Do you sell your artwork to students or even non-students? Oh gosh, I don't sell my daughter and I don't sell my artwork, <laughs> but I'd be happy to teach you how to do them and, uh, and discuss and I wanna have, I, I wrote some article again in my website there is so how to do some of these things. And you know, the good thing is making them. So I'm, I'm, I'm about to write, you know, and put them in Google how to explain because uh, I know occasionally I give some dear, dear friends get something. My husband has a bottle, plain bottle hat, which he never wears. It's a very weird thing, but, uh, but I'm happy to share by teaching. <laughs> Great. Yes, there's a plain bottle in the back. Yes, I see the question. Where is the plain bottle? There's, there's many clay bottles here. Here is one, a colorful, and the color have meaning, which again, I'm just, shamelessly advertising about Stony Brook, you can, if you come to Stony Brook, I'll explain you what the colors mean. This is a Klein bottle. And again, a Klein bottle really, really lives in four dimensions too. We have to do something weird to bring it to three dimensions, but that takes too long to explain, unfortunately. One of the attendees said owning a Klein bottle hat has been a dream of his. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have another question. Is there a way to travel to the four dimension plane? Well, with our mind, you know, with our mathematical mind, learning, 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 and understanding. Okay, great. 
So if anyone has any other questions, make sure you put them in the q and A. I'll give it a, like a minute or two so you guys can submit those because we do still have a little bit of time. So any other questions, feel free to submit them. But in the meantime, where is there anything else that you'd want to share with the students today? Either that you went over, that you didn't cover, any advice you have? Well, for me, the advice is, uh, I don't know, be really hungry for learn. You know, math is really uh, generous when you work on it. You know, sometimes you sit and work and, you know, maybe go and ask and interact. And, you know, really something happens out of it. So, and I strongly believe that everybody can learn math. I mean, I, when I hear this thing about a math person, which is something that we don't have in Spanish, it's like, no, we are all math, you know, math is like language. I mean, I'm, I'm not a worse person. I don't talk. No, well, well, some people cannot talk for, you know, particular circumstances, but in general, if you're human, you can do math and you can understand it. And little kids are naturally mathematicians and sometimes we lose it as we grow up. So believe that and, uh, and don't lose it, you know, reclaim it. And we all should be ambassadors for math because it's a beautiful thing that everybody, almost everybody can understand. Great, thank you. We did get, we got a, quite a few more questions actually. Um, could time be the third dimension in Flatland? If we look at it, maybe we could see a static 3D continuum? Yep. Yeah. You can think, you know, like, you know, if you, if you look at it, like this fear passing by, remember that that image, well, there, you know, the time is, is showing this fear, you know, each slice is like a different instant in time when you see this fear. Thank you. What's the largest dimension in the world? There's no bound. Sometimes there's no largest. It can be as large as you want. It might sound crazy, but can dimension be a decimal like 3.5, for example? Well, again, that's an interesting question. Uh, the answer is kind of yes. You have to make sure to explain what do you mean by dimension. Again, uh, I gave you a definition that is pretty rigorous, but uh, it's a it's a hard hard idea so yes you can you know you might have heard our fractals those are spaces of you know dimensions that are not integer like uh you know like a snowflake or the coast of england which is incredibly weakly uh but again we have to say exactly what we mean and you know after that yes we will have you know non-integer dimensions great thank you is it possible for creatures living in different dimensions to communicate? I don't know, creature. I only know creatures living in this world, uh, but I will always hope that people can communicate. <laughs> and it looks like this is our last question. Can there be complex dimensions? I don't know. I don't know how to make sense of that, uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, you know, it cannot be a way. Okay. All right, great. Do you have, um, as far as if students or anyone who attended, if they do have additional questions, is there a contact method that you prefer to give? Email to? is pretty good. And you know, if I don't answer, you should insist because occasionally we get all this enormous amount of, you know, I know usually I love these math questions, and but I get all these bureaucratic things that I have to do. We have a character in Argentina that says, the urgent never leaves you time for the important. <laughs> Sometimes I have a lot of urgent, but please insist. And, you know, Moira Chas, you know, Stony with you, you'll find it in my website. Okay, yeah, it looks like uh, Tian just shared it in the chat. So for anyone, sure. if you didn't get to your question or anything today, or you come up with questions later, uh, definitely feel free to email Moira. Um, but I guess that brings us to a close. Thank you, Moira, for presenting today. We definitely appreciate it. We have a lot of thank yous in the chat. I don't know if you saw them. Um, see, I like the thank yous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And thank you all who attended and for TN and Lyle in the background, helping out with the chat functionalities. And we hope you have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening and asking questions. Uh, good audience. <laughs> awesome. Have a great night, guys. Bye-bye.